Howdy folks, this is Jimmy Aiken, and I wanted to let you know about a special offer. When you become a patron of the Cordial Catholic Podcast at $8 or more a month, Keith will send you a copy of my new book, The Bible is a Catholic Book. To become a patron, just go to patreon.com slash cordialcatholic. Hi, hey, welcome to the Cordial Catholic. This is a podcast for non-Catholics, new Catholics, and those looking to dig deeper into the Catholic faith. I'm K. Albert Little. I'm a non-denominational evangelical convert to Catholicism. And this podcast is born out of one particular idea. To correct misunderstandings about the Catholic Church. As an evangelical, I understood very little of the Catholic Church. What I thought I knew ended up being completely wrong, I found out as I began to look into the Catholic Church from the heart of the Catholic Church. When I began to read Catholic things from Catholic authors, I realized that what I knew about the Catholic Church was often completely wrong. Fake news, if you will. This podcast is meant to fill in those same gaps. We talk to real Catholic thinkers about real Catholic topics from the heart of the Catholic Church. No misinformation here. On this episode, I'm joined by writer Pat Flynn to talk about the question, which I think was fundamental for me as an evangelical, do Catholics have a personal relationship with Jesus? I would have said fundamentally no as a non-denominational evangelical. I would have believed that I had a relationship with Jesus. It was manifest in all kinds of different ways, reading my Bible and praying and going to worship services and church on Sunday. I believed that I had a very deep relationship with Jesus. It was central to my life. It was. But I wouldn't have said that Catholics had that same relationship. Well, Pat and I, both converts, unpack this question. Do Catholics have a relationship with Jesus, a personal relationship? It's a fascinating and fantastic conversation, and I think you'll really enjoy it. If you are a non-Catholic Christian listener, I think especially pay attention to the conversation because I think you'll learn a lot of new things about what Catholics actually believe about a personal relationship with Christ. I would have learned a ton from this interview when I was an evangelical. Maybe you will too. A couple of notes with the podcast. We have a brand new logo designed by an old friend of mine, Tom Froze, a fantastic illustrator and designer out of British Columbia, Canada. It's a fantastic logo. If you have not seen it yet, open up your podcast app, open up the website, take a look. I love it, and I hope you do too. Another note for my patrons. If you are a patron of this show, if you sponsor this show at patreon.com slash cordialcatholic, you now have access to a special behind-the-scenes podcast. I'm recording this podcast at least once a month to give you a preview of guests coming up, a behind-the-scenes look at the show, and to answer any questions and feedback I might be receiving. It's a fun little extra podcast, a way of saying thank you to my patrons. If you want to support this show, for even $1 or $2 a month, it goes a long, long way to help covering the costs of making this show. It's at patreon.com slash cordialcatholic if you want to support the show and get access to the new Behind the Scenes podcast. I would love your support. Without any further ado, here's my fantastic interview with Pat Flynn on the question, do Catholics have a personal relationship with Christ? Please listen and enjoy. Welcome back to the podcast. This week I'm joined by Pat Flynn. Now, if you know who Pat Flynn is, you'll know exactly why I want to have him on the show. He's going to be a fantastic guest. If you don't know who he is, you're a little bit behind the ball because my description of him is not going to really help you very much. But we'll try it anyway. 
He's a writer, he's a fitness guru, he's an entrepreneur with a degree in economics and another degree in philosophy. He is an author, he is host of the popular podcast The Pat Flynn Show, and he is a regular contributor to the Word on Fire blog, part of Bishop Barron's Word on Fire Ministries. He's a fantastic commentator, thoughtful uh, speaker on all things Catholic and a lot of things philosophical. Uh, Pat, welcome to the show. Keith, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. I think that uh, listeners will quickly understand why I'm excited to have you on the show, because you speak so well on these topics, very succinctly, uh, much better than I do as I ramble off your introduction. But uh, I'm excited to have you. Well, that was very flattering. It was almost as if I wrote part of that. I I appreciate it, Keith. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you did send me a small introduction, but you know what? It barely hit any of the main points of what you're up to, so I, I had to uh, I had to add a bit on there. You're doing so many things, and you are are, are truly um, well. I mean, you you have this approach of generalism, and and really you you live that out because you you have so many things on the go, and you're good at so many things. And I really I'm glad to have you here. Well, thank you very much. And the, the whole concept of generalism, which is a, a core tenant of my brand and the theme of not to start the shameless self-promotion too early, but my most recent book, How to Be Better at, at Almost Everything, really comes down, if I'm being perfectly frank, to the, to the fact that I just was never the best at anything I really, <laughs> I really attempted to be very good at. So I more or less just had to settle with getting, you know, decent, good, or at least fairly competent at a wide range of things and then finding ways to kind of stack skills and hobbies and interests to form competitive advantages or to create some type of unique message that somehow serves people. And people have resonated with the idea of generalism because I think a, a lot of people get trapped in this idea of hardcore specialization. I certainly did. And part of the, my message is to say, hey, you can, you can have a good life. You can have a really successful life. You can find a lot of meaning in the work you do without having to drive yourself insane or compare yourself to, to other people on a very technical level. And, and life is also, I would argue, a lot more interesting when you explore a lot of different subjects, activities, hobbies, and things like that. So pretty much entirely unrelated to the conversation we're about to have, but that's the general perspective I'm coming from. <laughs> well, it served you well. And you know what? It, I, it does fit very well into Catholic apologetics, though, certainly, right? You know, I think it does um, for no other reason than I think even a, even apolog- even apologists and theologians and philosophers they can they can get trapped uh, in in hardcore specialization as well, where they get they get so uber focused on one particular thing that they can lose sight of the grand picture, or they can or they can you know somehow lose the ability to uh, effectively communicate with other people. You know, they might gain highly specialized knowledge. Uh, but then they're, they might be also be incredibly boring to be around. <laughs> and I found that part of, the, the, part of the, the, the sort of subject of apologetics also has largely to do with building relationships with people, uh, building genuine friendships, and then, you know, getting them to open up to hearing your perspective. So, you know, you can have a ton of knowledge in a specific area, but if you don't at least have some other skills, some other people skills, some other, some other interests and hobbies where you can connect with people and find some common ground, a foundational starting point for future conversations. I think I think you're going to be very frustrated in the overall uh, apologetic project. So, yeah, I would say that there's there's definitely applicability there to the idea of general of generalism in apologetics. Awesome. Okay. Well, our topic today is talking about this one of these marquee questions to me. I think, and it's the idea of the question of do Catholics have a personal relationship with Christ? This is something that you hear often repeated in evangelical Protestant circles. I know as a convert to Catholicism, this was something that I heard a lot in my evangelical orbits. Um, And that's going to be our question, but I want to start at the beginning with you. And maybe you could give listeners a little bit of background into your own kind of conversion story. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So for many years, I would have considered myself an atheist. And I was actually baptized Catholic, but I fell away from the faith at a pretty young age. I'm actually writing an article recounting a a bit of my story now. And the first seed of doubt for me actually happened in my fifth grade science class, where uh, 
my teacher outlined a few of the, the details of the, of the origin of our universe, the Big Bang Theory. And I remember thinking, how does this square with what I've been learning in Sunday school with, you know, the six days of, of creation and Adam and Eve and, and all that? And I didn't realize that at the time, but that would, that would become the germ of my spiritual unfolding. And that was kind of the initial crack in, in my faith that uh, over many years would would you know continue to grow until I eventually just uh, abandoned religion entirely and it was in, in probably early high school uh, through my interest in, in writing there was a, a writer that I really enjoyed his name was H.L. Mencken and if anybody's familiar with him they'll, they'll remember he was uh, an ardent old atheist I mean first off an immensely interesting writer he was kind of a uh, the, the, he was a he was a very Christopher Hitchens like writer, very very polemic, uh, very controversial, uh, but but extre- but extremely interesting, often funny, had a really great prose style. So so I, I really enjoyed him. Uh, but he was uh, one of the first people to produce an English uh, work of Friedrich Nietzsche. So he kind of introduced me to uh, many of the other old atheists and, and existentialists, and they they deeply uh, colored my worldview and. Um, not only continued my interest in philosophy, but continued my uh, interest in atheistic philosophy in particular. So I, I really went down that road um, for, for quite some time. Uh, but eventually, uh, just to make a, a long story short, um, I didn't uh, leave atheism because I had some type of mystical or religious experience. I eventually abandoned atheism because I, I realized it just doesn't work as, as, a, as a worldview. When you really try to get atheism to work, like metaphysical naturalism, and you, you try to c- construct uh, a worldview uh, of how to make sense of, of everything when, when your fundamental belief is that only physical things exist, you wind up in a, in a, in a very awkward position of essentially having to, to deny some, some very basic and intuitive features of, of reality, things like uh, morality, uh, other things like consciousness, for example. And there's, there's many atheistic philosophers, they're often called eliminativists, who take this, this very position. And what I like about the eliminativists, not to draw the story out too much, is I think they're, I think they're consistent with the, with the atheistic project. Um, but to the extent that they're consistent, it tends to lead to incoherency. And that was kind of the position that I found myself at, Keith, is, is I got to this point where, I'm, where I'm, I'm kind of trying to shove off everything that I think is is good and true and, and precious about the world that doesn't really fit with the world view that I'm I'm trying to construct and you, you kind of come to this fundamental impasse um, and then and then I, I kind of realized well do I do I really have any very good reasons for assuming atheism in the first place because you know if I'm going to throw off things like objective morality or consciousness or, or meaning then then I have to be really sure <laughs> like really really sure that atheism is correct. Um, so I essentially concluded that there's no way that that can possibly be true. And uh, it encouraged me to go back and study other philosophical thinkers, other philosophical schools of thought. Uh, I wanted to go back and trace the line of the, the ancient and medieval thinkers up through the contemporary thinkers uh, in, in different traditions, but specifically in theistic traditions. Uh, so, you know, working my way from Plato to Aristotle, uh, eventually brought me to Thomas Aquinas, and he, like he is for many people, was a, a fundamental turning point for me because I finally encountered somebody who had developed a, an extremely robust uh, philosophical worldview that could accommodate all the things that that needed to be accommodated uh, and could make sense of them in a really in a really clear and, and consistent and compelling way. And he was able to do it from a standpoint of reason. So. You know, at this time, I, 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 was, I, I wasn't a Christian. I often say I became a Thomist before I became, <laughs> became a Christian. So I, I wouldn't have taken arguments from Scripture very seriously at this point. I was really just kind of taking a philosophical journey. Uh, and Thomas Aquinas really helped me to see that there could be a deep compatibility between the religious worldview and a worldview based on reason. Uh, as well, once you, once you read contemporary Thomists, they do a great job of showing the, the, the deep compatibility between this philosophical system and contemporary science as well. And I found all of that uh, very intriguing, very satisfying. Um, so that, of course, kind of brought me to a general theism. And then uh, from there, I was obviously uh, interested in the historical 
uh, question. You know, uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas was obviously a Christian. He was a Catholic. I had a lot to say about about the, the Catholic Church, about about Scripture, about Jesus, about God. Um, so I, I wanted to know, you know, is there is there any plausibility to all this other stuff? Is, is there a chance that Christianity might be true? And that's when I had to uh, kind of take the historical journey. And um, through various uh, modern day uh, historians and, and apol- apologists uh, who often kind of provide the historical grounds for the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, I, I became convinced of it. And that, that seemed essentially correct to me. Um, but at this time, I didn't become, <laughs> interestingly enough, as much as Catholic thinkers were shaping my worldview, I had a sort of very deeply ingrained uh, prejudice against the Catholic Church that I actually started attending various evangelical and, pro- and uh, Lutheran uh, congregations. Um, and then this was when, I, of course, uh, I started to have difficulties with uh, a lot of their a lot of their teachings, um, especially with regards to sola scriptura. Uh, I tried to make sense of that. Um, it seemed that no matter where I went within the sort of Protestant world, that none of them could agree on anything. I found this uh, deeply troubling because they were all apparently working from the same book. Uh, and that's what led me to consider that uh, maybe the claims of the Catholic Church of, of being able to provide some contextual authority could have some merit. And then a further investigation of the of early Christian history of the Church Fathers uh, led me to see that, yeah, God left us not with a book. He left us with, uh, he left us with a church that was visible, hierarchical, unified. And especially the thing that got me, Keith, was sacramental, uh, seeing uh, just how unyielding the devotion was of the of the early uh, church fathers to the real presence of the Eucharist. I think more than anything uh, is is what you know eventually led me to becoming Catholic. So I'm sorry you you probably wanted a condensed version, and <laughs> but there's a lot to unpack with that. No, not at all. I'm looking at my clock here, and that was maybe ten minutes or so. But I I can't think of a better way of spending ten minutes <laughs> than listening to that because y- y- you put it so succinctly and truly your journey just kind of covers everything you come out of you come out of a, a faith that left you asking all kinds of questions into an atheism and and not into not into this kind of blind new atheism that you're just rebelling against some something out there but a very thoughtful and 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 academic kind of atheism and then into this in, into philosophy and into Aquinas, which leads you to ask more questions. And I mean, your journey kind of covers all, all the bases I can think of in just a fantastic conversion story. Well, it's it's certainly been an interesting journey, uh, it, if nothing else. And to your point about atheism, I think that's worth pressing on a minute because you know you have these new atheists out there, and I have to say I was I was never impressed with any of them, even when I was an atheist. It's sort of a very superficial and, and lazy atheism. And, and you hear this a lot from atheists these days where they'll say, you know, I don't, I don't have to prove that God doesn't exist. I don't have a burden of proof. And we can quibble, you know, whether that's really atheism or agnosticism or what have you. But, but when I was going into atheism, I did it, you know, I did it because I wanted to be intellectually fulfilled. Like I wanted to know what, what this world is that we live in. I wanted to have questions answered. That's why I pursued it, because I didn't think that the religious worldview could answer those questions. So I think sometimes people kind of get into this very superficial atheism, uh, maybe because they're a teenager or it's, or it's edgy or, or whatever. And I can understand, you know, whatever, you know, or, the, or they were burned by some religious person. And, and my sympathies are certainly strong with, with people who experience some type of you know, whatever, distaste for religion because of, the, of people who treated them poorly. Um, but it, it was it was frustrating to me, even as an atheist, how uh, so many uh, people, often younger people, millennials, my generation, uh, how superficial they would be with it. And and um, and at least for me, the the reason I went in, on, in that direction and the reason I took it seriously is because is because I thought it could answer fundamental questions that I, I felt were important to answer, that I needed answered. And when, when you press in that direction, um, <laughs> I think it's going to get you to, to an eerie and pretty dismal place, but also a place that, that really, you know, certainly it's, it's emotionally difficult to accept, but I think it's logically unacceptable as well. And that's where the project just completely collapsed for me. 
Yeah, you make a very good point. It's not, it's not something that you entered into as a kind of rebellion against this religion that you knew. It was something you intentionally sought out looking for answers, and you couldn't find them there. I think that's such a fundamental point to underscore. Yeah, and, you know, I don't want to make it seem like it was just this, this dry intellectual intellectualism, and there wasn't any emotion either. You know, I was I was young. You know, there's some there is something kind of edgy and rebellious about you know reading Friedrich Nietzsche or <laughs> or any of these kind of existentialists in high high school as well. So it was kind of it was kind of a both and for me. You know, part of it was like, okay, this is kind of contrarian. This is kind of interesting. This is kind of cool. It doesn't seem like anybody else in my school is into any of this. You know, <laughs> but at the same time, I really thought that they they were on to something. I really thought. That that they could kind of lead me in a direction where I would be able to, to find answers to, to my questions. So I just want to be <laughs> completely fair. It's not, you know, you know, everybody <laughs> has their emotional and psychological reasons for why they do something. Um, and it, but at least for me, I think it was it was it was kind of both of these factors that that kind of led me where I went. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Okay, so let's take a little sidestep here into this topic. And this is kind of based on an article that you wrote on the Word on Fire blog and. I want to dig deeply into this because this is, like I said, one of those, I think, marquee kind of big questions that evangelical Protestants would have about Catholics. I certainly had this. I mean, I had my own faith journey um, kind of after radical conversion to Christ in high school. I went through, I went to a variety of different evangelical churches and I began uh, to explore Catholicism. Um later on in, in university after some some prompting questions from some Protestant pastors who were on their own kind of journey. And I found that often you'd hear this, especially from former Catholics who were now evangelicals, the idea of a relationship with Christ. Uh, this kind of tagline mm-hmm. for evangelical Christianity, I would say, especially um, now that a lot of evangelicals are even moving into kind of an ex-evangelical space. You hear a lot of this idea of the evangelical church kind of, I don't know how to say it, evolving or changing. And and it's even less about the Bible now and these kind of rules or routines or rituals. And it's all about a relationship with Jesus. What do you make of this idea mm-hmm. of a relationship with Jesus? <laughs> Uh, well, oh boy, I mean a lot. So, uh, like where to begin is, is the question here. You know, I do, th- I do think it is, uh, it is interesting, this, this sort of ex-evangelical phenomenon that you're, that you're talking about. I'd be curious to hear more about that. If, if we have time, maybe we can jam on that a little bit. Uh, but this was something that I, I have to say, when I was going to, to various evangelical congregations, uh, people would ask me, you know, hey, do you have a, a personal relationship with, with Jesus? And I would, I would kind of ask, well, like, what does that, what does that mean? And it ultimately seems to kind of come down to some type of feeling. And I think, on some level, I don't want to say that that feelings aren't important. Uh, I certainly don't believe that. Um, but kind of coming from a skeptical uh, background um, I'm, and just not being much of a general feelings person to begin with. I never found that approach to be very compelling because people from all different religions claim some type of, of, of special kind of inner witness, right? The burning in the bosom or, you know, they just, they just know it to be true because they just feel it, right? Um, so in, immediately when, you know, I would ask people, well, how do you, how do you know that, that, that you know, this, this, this is true here, that, that, you know, that what your church teaches is true versus any other church? And they would say, well, I, I know because of the sort of, the inner witness, right, of what's going on in my personal relationship. And that seemed to be a complete non-starter for me, at least as, a, as any type of convincing argument, because any person from any religious background could essentially claim the same thing, whether Mormonism or Islam or, or Christian science or whatever. So I just, I just never found that to be um, at least intellectually satisfying or compelling. And so, so in one sense, it would always just kind of bounce off me like a ping pong ball. On another sense, however, I certainly do believe that God wants us to have a very intimate and close relationship with him. Um, and so I was, I was intrigued in, in, in that part because, yeah, like just the, just the idea that we could have a relationship with God, like if that's possible, then, then obviously I want to go all in on that. Uh, you know, Aristotle actually kind of famously held that, that we couldn't be friends with God. Uh, and that's kind of the radical difference of, of Christianity is that it claims that God loves us and he, he wants to have an eternal friendship with us in light of the beatific vision. And that's, that's like an incredible thing. 
So I guess my 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 first impression was was kind of like a yes and no, like like I, I like the kind of sentimentality of it was a bit was a bit of a turn off as as a kind of an argument. I, it never really made much sense to me. But then on a much deeper level, I think that um, there was a, a deep intrigue and pull here to try to try and understand well, well what do we really mean by having a relationship with someone. And uh, interestingly enough, Keith, it was actually at, a, at an evangelical church um, where I asked a, a young lady there. I said, OK, so, you know, what is it that, that your church here believes? And she said, well, we believe, uh, you know, what we, what we try to believe what the earliest Christians believed. And I said, well, that's really interesting. That sounds like a really good way to uh, to kind of figure this whole thing out. <laughs> and little and little did she know, she kind of set me on the path to Catholicism from from that point on. Right. That was what kind of initially began my uh, investigation into the early church fathers to see to see how they thought about having a relationship to Jesus Christ. And it, it, the kind of point I make in the article that you reference, Keith, is that a relationship kind of has to work, in my mind, in, in both ways, right? And I know um, some people think of the idea of religion as kind of being this, this kind of old, mildewed, archaic notion. It's very, it's very oppressive. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's something of the past. You know, it's the Catholic Church. Uh, we're beyond that now. But religion, in the, in the technical sense, uh, really is, is, is a virtue, right? The virtue of religion means a sort of not just a linking back, but a fulfilling of a very important moral obligation that's tied to justice in the sense that, that God has rights over us and we owe God uh, certain moral obligations. Uh, and, and they're kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of almost kind of sad to think about it because we'll never be able to repay God for everything that he's given us, right? But uh, certainly we should make an attempt through an act of justice to, to give God what, what he is due. And worship is certainly one of the things that God, as a morally perfect being, is due. So if you see religion as, as both a linking back in a traditional sense and as a virtue, I think you can start to make sense of this relationship question, because then you can flip it kind of on its head. And that's what I try to do in this article, uh, because a lot of people want to say, well, I have this personal relationship with Jesus. And on some extent, I, I completely believe that they, they, they do, and that's authentic and it's objective. But the question that I fundamentally wanted to, to have answered was, okay, but is there a specific way that God wants us to have a relationship to him? Because if there is, and we can figure out what, like, what the nature of that relationship is, then I think we might be able to figure out the question of what, if any, religion is true. And that, uh, in turn, goes back to the, the kind of uh, hunt that I went on. Uh, that, that began in the evangelical church of saying, well, okay, how did the people who were closest to Jesus uh, act out their relationship with him and the tradition that he left? And as it turns out, it was acted out in, in it was acted out largely sacramentally uh, with, with uh, an affirmation to the real presence, to the, to the, to the, you know, we would call it now transubstantiation that Christ gave us a, a church his, his body, the, the Catholic Church that he wants us to be a part of, that he wants us to benefit from and, and receive special graces by participation in the sacraments. I think a good way to think of the Catholic Church is, you know, uh, it's not just the body of Christ, but the sacraments are sort of the arteries and their privileged means of receiving God's grace. They are specifically a way that Christ says, I, this is how I want you to have a relationship with me. So utterly intimately that I'm going to give you myself body, soul, blood, and divinity uh, through stuff, through physical stuff. And that was incredibly interesting to me because cause God always worked through physical stuff in the Old Testament. So then when you see that continuity through the Catholic Church, you're like, that's, that's not only interesting, but that's beautiful, right? Because we're physical creatures. So it kind of makes sense that God would want to continue to work through physical stuff and commune with us through physical stuff. I just dumped a whole load of stuff out there, <laughs> but it's a, it's a really big question. But So that's at least in part how I would start to, to think about it. You see, and this is exactly why I wanted to have Pat Flynn on the podcast, folks, because he's just answered all the questions that I had for him just so succinctly, and, and we're just halfway through. 
That's, that's fantastic. Well, sorry if I skipped ahead a little bit, but it's kind of it's kind of hard to parse some of these these things out. But uh, oh, it really no. is a, a fascinating topic. It's fantastic, and you know what? I wanted I want to unpack a lot of this because it is fantastic, and your perspective is a, is a great one. And so, I'm thinking when you when you encounter these evangelicals who would have said something like, you know, the core of what we believe is having a relationship with Christ. What, what I found when I used to say that and mean that is it, it meant different things where, you know, which section of Protestant Christianity you were a part of. I mean, I, I'd been to very charismatic Pentecostal churches, and we would have said our relationship with Christ looks like speaking in tongues or this very charismatic worship music and um, this kind of very emotional experience. That was a relationship with Christ. Or you'd go down the street to a Baptist church, and your relationship with Christ how you would make sure that you're maintaining that relationship, you're building that relationship, is that you're reading your Bible every day, and you're praying every day, and you're going to church on Sundays and Bible studies on on Wednesdays. So we were still doing things as having a relationship. I'm even thinking of, you know, I mentioned just offhand these kind of this ex-evangelical kind of kind of movement and uh, you know, I have we have friends, my wife and I, who are still in evangelical churches, and mm-hmm. emphasis is being placed more and more. And, and you'll hear this; I've heard this more and more on a relationship with Christ, on who Christ was, than on the Bible. So that I mean that leads you to the question of, well, how do you know who Christ was and what he wanted of you in a relationship uh, apart from the Bible? There there are certain challenges there, but we're, we're even yeah. Whatever what I'm trying to say is whatever expression of Protestant Christianity you're a part of um, that has a relationship with Christ, you you're still doing something to be in that relationship. Um, but you so eloquently explained how the Catholic Church, what we're what we're doing as Catholics, um, which is often called religion, we, we call it religion, is a is a special kind of relationship. Yeah, yeah. So just to jam on a few of the points that you brought up, because I think you, you bring up a lot of, of interesting perspectives there. Um, first is, uh, is, is the idea of, okay, well, who am I having a relationship with? That, I, that seems fundamentally important, right? If, if you love somebody, um, you know, I'm married, I, 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 I deeply love my wife. Part of that involves wanting to know something about them. Like you, you, you just develop this sort of insatiable curiosity about this this object of your affection this 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 love of yours so you know that just comes with a certain kind of series of questions that you think you would want answered one being what we already hinted at okay you know what can i do for you right or how do you want me to have a relationship with you but also things like you know who is this person um and these were things that when i was kind of hopping around you know the the world of protestantism people did not have consistent answers to um, you know, some so far even as to, to deny certain aspects of Christ, Christ's nature, like his divinity, which seemed fundamentally very bizarre to me. Um, so that's, that's, you know, and that's part of the issue, I think, of Sola Scriptura, is that clearly this book does not interpret itself. If it did, then we wouldn't have tens of thousands of denominations of Christianity that all claim to have the right interpretation of it, right? So is there some type of interpretive context or authority or tradition as Catholics hold, that can help us, that can kind of set boundaries, if you will, to say, like, as long as you're in these boundaries, like, you're good, play ball, you can work out, you know, the uh, certain specific details for yourself and use experience and reason, but, like, just don't go out of these lanes, because <laughs> because that's, that, then, then you're in heresy, right? Then 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 you're kind of being led astray. Um, and it seems like in, in Protestantism, oh, so much of it, too, was, was again, it was, it was utterly subjective. And, and a lot of it was feelings based and that and that worried me. And I know there's been a couple instances in the Protestant world recently, I think, with a, a very popular musician and a, and a former author, both of whom have renounced their faith. Um, I, I, and I think on grounds that are very intellectually weak. Uh, but I've seen this happen to people uh, is that they, they, they sort of have this romantic period of having what they call a personal relationship. But then feelings fade. And then when those feelings fade, they start to question their faith. And if, if their faith was only based on feelings or sensations to begin with, uh, then, you know, it, it, it doesn't become so much of a surprise when they renounce it completely. 
so I think that's I think that's a, a real danger, and I think that that's something that the Catholic that the Catholic faith has always kind of um, well, it rejects fideism, right? So it rejects, it rejects, you know, Catholic Catholicism is always a great both and. It's faith and reason, right? You know, they, they both come from the same source, as Aquinas said, you know, God. So that they can't really ever truly contradict. And we can use faith and reason to, to help kind of uh, sharpen and refine our, our perspective. Uh, and, if we, and I think if we, if we push reason um, far enough and, and we ground ourselves really intellectually in the faith, and we make sure that, you know, that we're, we're kind of in the right position. Uh, feelings are good. Experiences are good. Um, I never, I, again, I'm not a huge feelings person, but I think the closest thing I've ever come to a mystical experience really is in, in mass every single day when the, when the bell is, is, is ringing uh, during the Eucharistic prayer for transubstantiation. Like, I really do feel that God at that moment is present, that he's among us. Like, I really do feel that. But at the same time, if those feelings stop, I wouldn't stop going to mass because I think that the, the relationship that I have is so objectively real. Um, and I've, I've worked it out from so many different angles at this point. Certainly part of it is, is an inner experience. I don't want to deny that at all, but there's, 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 there's further grounds for why I'm there fundamentally because I believe that it's true and it would continue to be true no, no matter how I feel about it. And I think another helpful thing is you read the lives of so many great saints. I think of Mother Teresa uh, and how she continued to, to live her faith so beautifully despite uh, periods of, of incredible dryness. Uh, some might argue the periods of deep depression where feelings were, 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 were really not there at all. And I think there's an important lesson from that is that God doesn't want you to fall in love with the feeling. He wants you to fall in love with him. And there's a fundamental difference. So feelings may be used at some points, I think, to help draw people in certain directions. But at the same time, if there's any lesson from the great saints, it's that God may actually purposely withdraw feelings at some point uh, for some type of greater moral purpose or good or lesson. So the, the big thing that popped out of me is, is of what you were saying, Keith, is that I think there is a real danger there. If it's entirely subjective or fideistic or feeling safe, that, um, you know, at some point, you know, those, those feelings could very well go away. And if that's all your faith is grounded in, I would be, I would certainly be concerned. Yeah, well, this comes back to something that you underscored earlier, and you underscored in this article as well. Be because the idea of religion, I mean, as an evangelical, religion had a bad, bad rap for me, right? It was every time associated with the Pharisees, and then by extension with the Catholics and the Orthodox, and these people who outwardly have all these rituals, and we called that religion. Now, that completely missed a lot of the point of what the Pharisees were being condemned for in the Bible by Jesus. It wasn't the rituals they were doing, it was, it was the orientation of their heart, it, truly, <laughs> you know. But religion then gets a bad right. rap, and got a bad rap in the circles that I ran with, and I gave it a, a bad rap. But what what you've explained, I think, is that religion is is can I put it this way a, a relationship with certain boundaries? I mean, it's it's knowing what the person you're in relationship with wants that relationship to look like, and then responding that way. That's what I think we're calling religion, right? It's just the re the framing of that relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah, I I think that's an. <laughs> One summary. Thank you for condensing my my rambling. <laughs> you know, Not at all. All that and 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 more into a into a very uh, concise statement. But I think that's correct. I think that the reason I am Catholic fundamentally is because I believe that this is the way that God has said I want you to have a relationship with me. So in, in that sense, it is relationship based, but it includes the traditions and the teachings and the authority of the church. So I don't. Again, I don't see these as being exclusive. I think it's. I think it's another one of those examples of the both Catholic great and, both and. Yeah, because I mean, when I had a relationship with Christ as a a, a Pentecostal um, young adult, I believe that relationship included things like speaking in tongues and going to these very vibrant, charismatic worship services. But then, I'd be hard pressed to locate that in in the Bible or the traditions of 
what Christians had done for 2,000 years. I mean, you have the Azusa Street Revival happening um, early, you know, not that long ago. But before that, you couldn't have found the kind of worship that I was taking part in happening in the church. Yet we would have said that that's the kind of relationship that Jesus wants us to be in. And and I found like what you found when you dig into the history of the church, you you realize that, and I think you said this, that the earliest Christians had a relationship with Jesus that looks a lot like the Catholic Church and and how we have a relationship today, right? Yeah, and if I can add one more note, one thing that that was that really. Um, did not sit with me uh, very well when I was before I was Catholic, and actually something that um, I have a friend currently um, that's in RCIA. He's an evangelical. He's going through RCIA. I'm his sponsor, so you know, God willing, he'll become Catholic here soon. And um, what happened was uh, at, at his particular um, evangelical church, uh, there was a great dispute among the the pastors theologically. You know, one was convinced that the other was was really wrong, and of course, vice versa. Um, so it, it, instead of, you know, being able to settle the dispute, there was, there was essentially a schism, right? The, the one guy went off and, and took half the congregation and started a new church. And this really bothered my friend. And I said, Hey, actually, uh, this is something that bothered me with all of Protestantism, right? Because one, it seems like there's, there's really deep scriptural support for excommunication, right? When Christ says, Hey, if, if you, if a, if a brother sins against you, you know, you know, take it to him privately first, then get witnesses, but then take it to the church, right? Now, that that's really interesting um, because that means the church must be something like visible and unified in order to, 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 <laughs> to have any type of, of authority here, right? And then if, if that still doesn't settle the matter, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector, which really, as Catholics, we see very clearly as grounds for excommunication, which people should know is actually meant to be. Uh, and this is where 1 Corinthians 5 comes in, where, where Paul reaffirms this. Excommunication is meant to be a medicinal remedy. The, the purpose of excommunication is to actually bring somebody back into the church, to help them understand that you need this relationship with God. You need God's grace. So uh, sometimes people have a caricature of excommunication, but it's really, it's really meant to be an act of mercy. It's meant to be medicinal uh, to help people kind of, uh, Paul says, turn turn them over to Satan. He means turn them over to their suffering so they come to realize how much that they may repent, right, and how much they need this. So that's an important distinction. But you cannot make sense of excommunication with Protestantism. You just can't, right? Because anytime there's some type of dispute or somebody's convinced that the other person is wrong or blah, 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 uh, they'll just form a new church. They'll just branch off into 45,000 different denominations, right? And that was a, a big issue for me. Uh, because uh, you cannot, I, I don't think you can, you can make sense of either the scriptural support for it or the church in general, um, uh, apart from the Catholic Church on this. And that was a big point for, for my friend as well, because he saw it, not just because it, you know, it kind of makes sense theologically or intellectually, but he saw it happen in real time in his church. And he saw it just tear the congregation apart. Uh, in a way that, that was really unsettling to him, and he didn't know how to make of it. And I think that um, once that, that, that he experienced that, that, that sort of opened him up to the idea, okay, maybe, maybe, there, maybe I'm missing something here. Um, and then he began to, like we're talking about, sort of investigate the historical claims of the Catholic Church, and, and now he's in, in RCIA, and, you know, uh, you know hopefully will be <laughs> baptized and confirmed, you know, <laughs> in, in fairly short order. Uh, that's kind of a side note, but it does it does tie into it again, I think, to the relationship aspect in at least some respects. But that was another big thing for me, and I think is a point that, that often doesn't get emphasized enough in this type of conversation. That's so funny. That's Matthew eighteen fifteen to 20. I know it well because that played a major role in my own conversion too, Pat. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it funny? You know, I'm thinking of like writing an article of like how excommunication brought me into the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah. You know what? <laughs> It's so fascinating. It's that, that part of the story, but it's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it played a major role for me too. I, I remember taking that taking that exact passage to my evangelical pastor at the time and saying to him, what does this mean? What does this mean for us? Because, and funny enough, that, that same church has had a schism since we've left, unfortunately. But, in, you know, what does that mean for a church that's not visible and unified and has... <laughs> 
has these strict boundary lines like the Catholic Church does. You know, you can tell when you're in and when you're out. It's very easy to tell, to take that test and decide. If you don't have those clear boundary lines, um, how can a brother who sins against you be put out of of the church if it's not this visible, united, clear thing, which is it's obviously not in the Protestant world, right? That's that's correct, and and you know I think that there are certain mental gymnastics that that couldn't be performed by certain Protestants, but they ultimately all the answers there came up as supremely unsatisfying to me. And then especially when you view that in light of Catholic teaching, then it actually makes perfect sense. Um, and it's kind of funny because it's it's around this idea of excommunication, which is you know which is a controversial topic in itself. Uh, but it's it's an it's an incredibly important teaching, not not just to get right theologically, but philosophically as well. It doesn't make sense apart from from unity, authority, and hierarchy. I would argue. So I think that's a I think it's a really important point to and to emphasize. And especially if you go back into church history and you read what uh, a lot of these church fathers thought about schism. I mean, it was considered one of the gravest sins. What it, what Irenaeus had to say about schism should send sh- chills up anybody's spine if they have the audacity to go and, and read, you know, what he wrote. And, and like, there was almost nothing worse than the idea of schism to a lot of, you know, to, to, to some of the earliest Christians and Catholics. Well, yeah, and it's really fascinating because, you know, in John 17, Jesus's high priestly prayer, one of his last recorded prayers ever in the Bible that we have written down, he prays specifically for, and I think prophetically, for the union of all of all Christians. But this was a verse that I didn't even have on my radar anywhere as an evangelical because it wouldn't have made any sense to me to, to be one as I and the Father are one. I mean, that's a closeness that could never possibly exist in in the Protestant world, right? Yeah, I agree with that because the, the concept of unity like philosophically, you, you, it does it doesn't apply to Protestantism. It clearly applies to Catholicism. You can't have Catholicism without unity. It's sort of essential to what Catholicism is. Uh, but Protestantism, it, it's certainly not uh, unified in an organizational sense, right, or an institutional sense. Uh, but even more so, it's it's absolutely not unified in belief. I mean, you have uh, completely opposing and contradictory beliefs among uh, uh in the world of protestantism so yeah i'm, I'm, I'm with you 100 percent. the idea of, of of unity there uh and that ties obviously into the idea of excommunication they can't really make sense of, apart from one another and all of that scriptural support i think cannot make sense apart from catholicism and this circles back to the idea of the relationship. I mean, how do you know how to have a relationship with Jesus? How do you know how he wants you to have a relationship with him when, as a Protestant, there are so many different expressions of that relationship? So you, and I found this as well, when I began to look into Catholicism, I found this tradition that stretches back to the earliest church fathers, these these. Uh, you know, disciples of the apostles who explain clearly the limits of this relationship. And, and that tradition continues on to today in, in the sacraments. And you, you touched a little bit on this because, and this was foundational for me too, finding the sacraments in the Old Testament. But can you unpack a little bit more about what that relationship to Christ as a Catholic looks like and how that is an, an agent style of, you know, an ancient way of having this relationship? Yeah, I think actually if I can re- recommend uh, one really good book on this, I would recommend anybody pick up uh, Brant Petrie's Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. And uh, it, it goes into far more detail than what we could cover in a conversation like this. But, but he systematically, go, you know, goes through the Old Testament and shows kind of what I said before, how God has always worked through stuff. Right to you know to to to, to help his his people, um, and that this this has really just been a continuity of of what God has always done before into the present age through the Catholic Church, and that I mean the biggest the biggest one for me was was the Eucharist itself. Obviously, seeing the parallels from you know the, uh, the manna from heaven um, and the bread of the face, and 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 how that just links back so so beautifully to to the Old Testament. Uh, and the sort of fulfillment of prophecies in, in relation to that. 
Um, but even even more so, like going back to again to the to the to church fathers and, and how they saw this is they they did see this as the the fundamental way of having a relationship with God and and the most and here's the the other key the mo- the most possibly intimate way as well. You know when when a, when Aquinas kind of had his um, attempt at, at 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 making sense of this philosophically, and he calls it, you know, and he it, this is where the term transubstantiation comes into play. So even that, even though that term originated later, it's really just describing something that was always believed uh, through Christian history. And the idea is that on the deepest metaphysical ontological level, there is a change of substance, right? So it's not transformation, right? It's it still it still looks like bread. It still tastes like bread. You run a DNA test. You look at it under a microscope. It's always going to appear like bread. So yet, and Aquinas was smart, right? He, he, he dude had a pretty good brain, right? It's transubstantiation, right? What it is in its fundamental, ultimate essence or substance is what is changing here, right? So it means across substance. So you know, when that Eucharistic prayer is confected, and here's another thing, right? It depends on the Eucharistic prayer and it being confected by a Catholic priest. So it's, it's not enough. I was talking to an evangelical who said, well, that all sounds good. Like, maybe I can just uh, believe it. And then it, it's true for me in my evangelical church. And I said, oh, no, no, no. That, that was actually a pretty early heresy as well. That was called the heresy of receptionism, right? It, and this goes back to feelings, right? It, it, doesn't, it, you're, it doesn't matter what your feelings are. It doesn't matter if you, if you feel or believe that the real presence is there. It either is or it isn't. Right. And, 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 and Catholic theology is so fundamentally realist and objective about this. Right. Uh, in, in every sense. Um, so it's, it's through that Eucharistic prayer as part of the Catholic Church that we have this, this, this miracle, this, this literal miracle at every mass where we get to receive Christ in the most intimate uh, way that we could possibly imagine. And the, and the graces that confers to us are just uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, I just wish I and I do wish that more Catholics. Uh, unfortunately, with the the recent Pew research that came out, it was it was very dismal, showing uh, how few Catholics actually are even aware of this fundamental teaching. So that's a, a separate issue because I think if if you were, and here's kind of a, a different side story. But when I was in RCIA, um, uh, a deacon was having a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness, and the Jehovah's Witness uh, questioned the deacon on on the real presence. He's like, I don't think you actually believe that. The deacon said, Why Why not? And the Jehovah's Witness said, because if I believe that, I'd be I'd be walking into mass on my knees. And that's the <laughs> best point I've ever heard a Jehovah's Witness make, ever. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely right. Right? That's correct. <laughs> and that's what that's that's more of the sort of mentality I wish people had around this is Christ left us with the most incredible way of having a relationship with him. And then there's the sacrament of confession, right? Again, deep biblical roots here of Christ giving his authority to his church to bind and loose sins and all that. But it's beautiful in the sense that, you know, it seems like, you know, God would want us to have that absolute assurance of sins. Like he wants us to know that our sins are forgiven and that the priests participating in the body of Christ, right? They're not, they're not a middleman. They're not trying to like go through some gate priest keeper, right? Like St. Paul says, I became a father in Christ. Like they're participating in the body of Christ. It's God who forgives your sins. But he wants you to, he's again, he's working through physical stuff. He wants you to have that assurance. He wants you to hear the words, your sins are forgiven because God loves you. And I think that that's just such an incredibly beautiful thing. And I think the more people realize that, the more they should avail themselves to this incredible sacrament and the graces that that, that sacrament confers. Uh, so that way they can, they can, you know, you're not just, I say, you know, I, I worry because I know some people have, have said this, that they're praying and they're not sure if God hears or if, if God really forgives them. And I think in, in large part, that's why he gave us the Catholic Church and the sacrament of confession. And he passed on his authority and he gave us a vicar, the Pope and, and all this good stuff because he wants us to have that physical assurance. So I'm uh, sorry, I went off on a complete rant again here. <laughs> <laughs> no. But, but, but you're right. There's, it's, it's not only uh, contiguous with uh, what, what God has always done throughout the Old Testament of working through stuff, but it's so, it's so utterly beautiful when it's properly understood. And what I found is that conversations both with, with kind of like nominal Catholics and certainly Protestants is I think once you kind of get past the misunderstandings and misconceptions, 
uh, an incredible beauty emerges from this. And, then it, and in many ways, it certain starts to become irresistible. And I've seen that with a number of my friends who were evangelical Protestants who, who started to convert to the Catholic Church. They had this yearning to want to participate in the sacraments once they start to see to see the, the sheer beauty of it, if nothing else. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you felt the same way. I know, I know that I did. I mean, once I began to unpack and understand the Catholic Church from the Catholic Church's perspective, you know, the reality, got past all these myths and and these misconceptions and things that I'm trying to in this podcast help to dispel. Once I got past those things and realized that hey, this church believes that you know this wafer becomes actually Jesus, and I can actually. I can consume Jesus and I can go to a priest and I can hear, you know, from the authority of Christ, you know, you know, as close as we can get to God talking into my ear to say, hey, you're forgiven of these things. Once I realized mm. that those things were a reality, I, I couldn't, you know, I, I can't underscore this enough, and I'm sure you feel the same way. There is no closer relationship in the, in the umbrella of Christianity than this ancient expression of the Catholic Church. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it was for me. Once I kind of arrived at these uh, conclusions, there was that you know, where else would I possibly go? Where else, what there's where, what else could I possibly want? <laughs> right? It's just like anything less than this, anything less than the sacramentality and the Catholic theology would would seem would seem empty. It would almost seem seem hollow. I think once it's properly understood and you really grasp the, the richness, the beauty, and the love that is inherent in the Catholic tradition, the Catholic religion, the Catholic relationship, um, yeah, there's, there's certainly no turning back. But I, I, I felt this irresistible pull um, where I, I, I knew I, I, I just had to become Catholic. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've got one one more question for you, and a bit of a lead up, a bit of a backstory here, because my my wife and I were were deeply involved in this non denominational evangelical church before we became Catholic, and you know it was the church we met in and got married by the pastor, and we're good friends with him and his wife, and we served on a missions committee and headed up small groups and did set up and tear down, and even were involved in a married couples ministry. And it was in this last ministry where we met a couple who were kind of a, a mentor couple for us. They were older than us, and they seemed wiser in their faith. And uh, they were we were talking over drinks one night about how grateful they were to have found the, the church that we were in. And then one of them said something kind of off the cuff. And at the time, it didn't really impact me, but I've, I've thought about it a lot since. And they said, you know, we used to be Catholic, um, and we just didn't have a relationship with Christ back then. We didn't really have a relationship with Jesus, and we're so happy to have that now. And and looking back, there were I, I would love to be back in that conversation because I'd have a lot of things to respond <laughs> to now. But I wonder what you would say. What would you say to actual real people who have left the Catholic Church or maybe aren't even willing to approach the Catholic Church because? They don't believe that there's a relationship with Christ in the Catholic Church. What would you say to those people? Yeah, it's it's a good question, and and the truth is, I might not say anything particularly at first, and and this is just kind of a, a practical note: is that when it comes to apologetics, I think people have to remember it's it's about helping people find the deepest possible relationship with God. It's about it's about saving souls, not winning arguments, right? So I think a lot of the time. Um, it, it's worth it to kind of play the long game. And especially, you know, whether you're Catholic or, or even just a Protestant Christian evangelist, I think there's a, a temptation to always kind of hop right into the arguments when you find somebody who doesn't, um, you know, believe everything that you believe. But I found it's often a lot more practical to kind of find some other common ground and, and really form a relationship um, and get people to, you know, kind of know you, like you, and trust you. And, and that way, I think more productive uh, dialogue can, can be had, and people will be more willing to hear your perspective. So that's just kind of a short aside, but I think it's important to keep, keep in mind. I'm sure we've all been in situations where we kind of just kind of like launch into arguments, and people immediately get very defensive, right? And, and we might have great arguments, we might be entirely right, um, but it, people just aren't receptive to it because we were, you know, kind of aggressive in, in the approach. So um, with, with that being said, you know, without repeating too much of, of what's been said in this entire conversation, um, I think that there's a, certainly a point that can be conceded in that uh, there are 
uh, unfortunately, a great number of Catholics, um, as the recent two uh, study has confirmed, that, that just really know nothing or next to nothing or certainly nothing very important about their Catholic faith. And so they, they lack the, the proper catechesis to understand what the Catholic religion is all about, which is fundamentally a relationship. So in one sense, I think if, if people's impression of, of the mass is just they're going to perform a bunch of Catholic calisthenics, they're burning calories and then they're getting a little you know, wafer to keep their blood sugar up, um, I can <laughs> sympathize with why they would have possibly left and felt that there was a more, uh, something more substantial in an evangelical church. Um, but that comes back to everything that we've just said is there's, you know, part of relationship involves a certain knowledge, right? It's, it's, it's knowing who that person is that you're having relationships with. And I'll admit that if, if you don't, um, if you've never been in a Catholic mass before or, or you, you don't know what's going on, uh, if you walk in there, it could it would probably see, seem something out of bizarro land. Because, and part of the reason is because it is linking back, right, to the great tradition. And to even understand the mass, you at least have to understand certain things about Judaism and, and the Old Testament and, 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 all, and all that. Um, so, you know, I would, I would, I guess, gently in, encourage them to to consider um, everything that we've talked about of, of saying hey I, I don't doubt that you know you have a real uh, faith and that that faith is, is authentic um, but then I would I would tell them my story and I feel that sometimes just telling stories is, is really powerful I would say you know I had the same thing you know I wanted to have a relationship with Christ and it struck me to ask the question of well is there some way that Christ has specifically requested <laughs> me to have a relationship with him because it seems like if I'm gonna if I'm gonna make you know make good by God, if I'm gonna fulfill that that obligation of justice of what is owed to God, then I should I should want to know is, is there some very specific way that God wants us to have a relationship? Because if there is, then I want it then I want it to be that way. Because I can trust, and here's the key point, right? That if God wants us to have a relationship a certain way, the reason He wants it to be a certain way is because that's what's best for me. Right. God is he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnibenevolent. So if he has specifically commanded or a, a way for us to have a relationship, um, I can trust that this is the best possible relationship that I could have. And that it's ordered toward my eternal happiness and fulfillment and, and it's, you know, life with, with God and the beatific vision. And if that's the case, then it's just a simple matter of, uh, I would argue, uh, not just biblical exegesis, but uh, studying Christian history, going back to the, the apostolic and church fathers and seeing what did the people closest to Christ think that a relationship with God should entail. And then I'd probably offer just, you know, a number of recommendations like Brent Petrie's book, for example, or uh, I think a guest of yours that you had on, Rod Bennett, he has a book called Four Witnesses, which is actually Absolutely excellent. So just trying to get them curious of, of, of that fundamental question, which is the inversion. I call it the kind of the inverted question of, okay, I, I want to have a relationship with Christ, but how does Christ want to have a relationship with me? And I think if you take that seriously and you try to, to really fill the details, uh, I, I believe that that's going to want to land you in the Catholic Church. <laughs> that's so well put. And you know, that was the question that uh, I think a lot of people ask and, and end up this way, right? If you, what kind of relationship does Jesus want me to have with him? Not what I want to have with him, although we know, as you said, that it is ultimately what we want the most, even if we don't know it or not at the, at the time. It's the best thing for us. But yeah, asking that inverted question is, is fantastic. That, that's so well put. Hey, thanks for being you know, on... And, and uh, sorry, just one more quick point. Is that, is that true, right? There's kind of uh, I don't want to call it an inherent selfishness, but it seems like a lot of people will be attracted to whatever religion uh, fits their fancy, right? Like, and the point is, is it, it, you know, when it comes to kind of what people talk about as spiritual experiences, whether it's a relationship with, with, with Jesus or whatever, um, you know, people, people say the same thing when that's, that's why they go to, to yoga or they read Eckhart Tolle or they become new age, right? Because it just, it satisfies them in some way. And I think we, we like just out of pure moral obligation that they ask, well, what satisfies God, <laughs> right? And in turn, what satisfies God is ultimately what's going to fulfill us, even as you said, Keith, even if that isn't particularly what I want here and now. So I'm really glad you brought that last point up because I think that was something that can be overlooked. 
<laughs> that's fanta- that's fantastic. Thanks for underscoring that, and thanks for giving us a, b- a bonus reply. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. Uh, where can people find out more about Pat Flynn? Oh, sure. Well, uh, my podcast. Um, and specifically, I think people might be interested in my... Uh, I have two segments, two fairly regular segments on my podcast. One is Philosophy Friday, and that's pretty much what it sounds like. We just you know, cover any topics and philosophy that happen to be of interest that day. And then I have Sunday School. Uh, and that segment is specifically uh, pertaining to Catholicism and theology. And I've had a lot of really great guests, some of the same guests that you've had. So certainly, I think if people have enjoyed your uh, conversations, uh, they'll probably uh, be able to expand on that. Uh, that's, that podcast is called The Pat Flynn Show, very humbly and originally named. Um, that's on it's on all your major platforms, iTunes and, and what have you. Uh, my website, chroniclesofstrength.com also host my podcast, but it's also, you know, for those of you who are interested in uh, other things like kettlebells or, you know, uh, sort of generalist fitness routines, I have a lot of content there as well. And the best way to hear from me would be to get on my email list, which uh, you can do right on my website. That's, again, chroniclesofstrength.com. And that'll pretty much, uh, you know, send you to all the other places you can find me online, which are too many and too boring to list now. (laughs) Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a really fun conversation. I think that listeners will really enjoy this and definitely check out other things that you are up to. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, God bless you and your family and the amazing work you are doing for the church. Thanks so much. Thank you, Keith. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Cordial Catholic Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Pat Flynn. Make sure to check out his podcast, The Pat Flynn Show, and his website, chroniclesofstrength.com. I'll list those as well in the show notes. Those show notes are found at thecordialcatholic.com, which is my website, also hosting recent blog articles I've written and show notes for past shows as well. Please make sure to rate and review this podcast if you can, wherever you listen to it. Those reviews and ratings help to push the podcast out to new people and grow this audience. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast as well, wherever you find it. iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn, Last.fm, we are everywhere. Please listen, please subscribe, please rate and review. It goes a long, long way. Our new logo this week... Our new logo forever now is designed by Tom Froze, a Canadian illustrator and designer out of British Columbia. He's an old friend of mine and a fantastic illustrator, fantastic designer, and I hope you like the new logo. Open your podcast app, check out the website if you haven't seen it yet. It looks wonderful. It's bright. It's fantastic. It's brand new. I hope that you like it. Email cordialcatholic at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at cordialcatholic, on Facebook at The Cordial Catholic, and on Patreon at patreon.com slash cordialcatholic, where even one or two dollars a month goes a long way to help supporting the show. I would love your support. Thanks for your prayers and fasting as well. I am praying for you. See you next week, and God bless. <laughs>